Hey there, pen fans. Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com. It is episode number 185 of Goulet Q&A. As you can see, I have not shaven much recently. You know, this just happens sometimes. I'm getting ready for November to roll around. Last couple of years, I've done No Shave November. It's probably coming up again this year. It's always Rachel's least favorite time of year because she's not a big fan of the facial hair. Uh, but no, this one is not planned. This is just out of sheer laziness. Plus, I was just like, yeah, let me grow it out a little bit. And I was like, well, I'm going to grow it out next month, so I'll probably shave it tomorrow. But anyway, you get to see me in my full bearded glory here today. Um, what have I been up to? Um, I love the Q, uh, QOTW question of the week responses from last week about what food tree that you would have in your backyard. That was a lot of fun, a lot of engagement there. So I appreciate all of you who uh chimed in there had some good responses meat lovers pizza chicken noodle soup lamb kebabs huevos rancheros french fries poutine shrimp and grits oh man i got so hungry just reading all those <laughs> it was really good so anyway um hope you enjoyed that one. Oh man i'm hungry right now even just kind of thinking about that honestly um i had some mic issues last week i don't know if it was actually the microphone i think it was more user error um but when i went to show the the pen cabinet i was i don't know what i was doing but i was like hardcore rubbing on the microphone and it sounded terrible and i just had did not have a good way to edit it out so i apologize for that hopefully it'll go a little smoother this week i switched out microphones just in case the other one was a problem i got my cell phone turned off i'm really trying here folks but you know uh still still kind of holding it together here but uh anyway that's what i'm dealing with um had some some good stuff come in in the last week and we got some cool things that are coming um we have a monteverde ink deal that's going on right now with all monteverde and conklin pens free bottle of 90 mil monteverde ink with any of those so you get a top choice we had we had to limit it because there's tons and tons of colors um, so we pick kind of the top 10 colors and you get a choice of any of those free now through the end of 2017 so it's a pretty sweet deal so you go to check that out. Um, we have the Monteverde Monza, which is a new pen that you have here. Um, uh, it's a small pen, inexpensive pen, and this is part of the Monteverde Ink deal too. So we're kind of taking a bath on this one, um, but uh, we're trying to do some exciting things for this coming holidays. Um, I've had no secret that we're going to be doing more sales and stuff uh, this coming holiday season. We just had our move. We have some of the wrong stock. We want to get some of the right stock in there. This, I think, is some of the right stock, so we want to get this out there, um, and we want to get you to see this new Monteverde ink that's coming out. So we're pushing that. So uh, it's kind of a cool deal for you, but the Monza is a pretty decent pen. Um, it's got uh, stainless steel nib. I am still, I haven't eyedropper convert tested it yet, but I believe that it's pretty eyedropper convertible. Um, and it's a cartridge, standard international cartridge converter pen. It's got a clear feed, demonstrator pen in three different colors, blue, orange, and smoke. So it's pretty sweet, gotta say. I haven't tested a whole lot yet. We literally like just got it in, um, but we'll have that uh, available for you this week. So you can check that out. Um, we have the Monteverde Noir inks, which is the inks that I've been alluding to for a while. Um, so we have those. We have them in a big 10 piece set, which I have all the way over there. And I was going to grab it and show it to you, but that's okay. Um, also, what have I got? I have the Lamy Blue Safari gift set. So we're gonna have more gift sets coming out this holiday season. We got this one in a little bit early. So we went ahead and said, what the heck? If you want it, might as well get it. Um, so it's a Lamy Safari pen with a bottle of blue ink, some cartridges and a Z24 converter. So you can check that thing out. Um, also, we have our Edison Nouveau Premiere in the fall color, which we are uh, announcing uh, this week, uh, which is called Bonfire. Uh, so I mentioned that it was going to be a fall theme, but maybe an obvious fall theme. Um, so it's a black and orange swirl. The orange has a lot of depth to it. The black is pretty much a straight black. Um, and then it's got black trim as well. So it's pretty sweet looking. Oh, I don't have a nib on this pen. How about that? But it's going to have a black nib. Um, it's a sweet pen. We are going to be slightly more limited on this one than we've been in some past ones. So if you are really in love with this one, uh, make sure you kind of jump on it. The season's going to be a little bit shorter uh, on this particular pen um, just because of the way things that worked out with uh, Edison and production and stuff like that. Um, so if you like it, go check it out. Um, and I was going to say something about this pen, and I uh, have kind of forgotten it. Oh, yes. Um, so there's a blend of orange and black on this one. And as with any pen that we get that has multiple colors in it, there's going to be some variations. Some are going to lean more orange, some are going to lean more black. So what we did this time is we took a picture of some kind of the variety and we put it up on the site so that you can check it out and not be so totally surprised 
We have a really hard time accommodating individual requests because you would not believe how complicated it can get sometimes, but um, I just wanted to try to make you aware of some of the range that it could go um, so that way you're not totally surprised on that. Some of them do lean a little bit more black, some a little more orange, but that's what we got. All right, what else? Um, some Lamy 14 karat gold spare nibs. We've never had spare gold 14 karat Lamy nibs. We had the chance to get our hands on a few of them, so I wanted to be able to offer them to you. If you like them and they sell really well, we will see if we can get some more of them, but um, we've never had them before. So you can, they literally, they fit on all the same pens that the stainless steel Lamy nibs fit on. The only one it won't fit on is the Lamy 2000, but it fits on all the rest of them. So check that out. We have that available on extra fine fine and medium. Don't have the broad, unfortunately. Um, we're also going to be getting a restock of the Twisby Classic in white and turquoise. I'd mentioned previously, I didn't know if we were going to be able to get more, and it turns out that we are. So those are going to be coming soon. I don't know exactly when, but sign up for the email notification list there so that you can be notified as soon as they come in. And uh, we got some other new things in the works, some stuff that's coming that I can't really talk about yet. Um, but it's going to be coming and it's going to be cool. So super general statement that doesn't really help you at all, but just stay tuned for more information on that. Um, and then we did find out recently the Twisby Mini in gold, Twisby Mini all in gold, uh, was announced on, on Twisby's uh, Instagram and Facebook and all that. So uh, I don't know exactly when we're going to have that available. Of course, we're like immediately like, yep, when can we get it? Um, I think it's going to be more towards the end of this month. So look out for that. We just found out about it. We're definitely going to carry as many of it as we can. Um, and it should be, it looks pretty cool. It looks pretty cool. So um, look out for that. All right. Let's get into the questions this week, shall we? I got seven questions for you this week. First one is a pen and writing question from Liquid's Liquid Sword 52. I thought I said Liquid's Word. Maybe it's Liquid's Word. Maybe it's Liquid Sword. I don't know. It's spelled the same way. Anyway, what is the next level after an Ahab pen? Is it a Pilot Falcon? Pilot Custom Heritage with a Falcon nib? It's a great question. Um, here's the weird thing about Noodler's Flex Pens. There's not a ton that's kind of comparable. There are some other brands that I don't carry that I'm not like super aware of um, that are some kind of like lower, lower priced flex nib pens, but they're, they're really kind of at best maybe comparable. They're not a next level thing from the Noodler's Ahab. Um, yes, you can go with another type of Noodler's pen like a Conrad. There's like the Conrad Acrylic or an Ebonite. It's really the same nib though, so I don't know if I would really call that an upgrade. The pen is slightly different. Um, but I actually like the Ahab uh, best, really, of all the Noodler's Flex pens. There's the Neponset, which is a larger pen. It's more expensive, but the nib is, is completely different. It's a fatter music nib. People tend to not like that one quite as much just because it's not as universal. It puts down a ton of ink. Um, it's good for some purposes, but it's not. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it a next level uh, from the Ahab necessarily. Um, to go up from there, pretty much you're looking at a Falcon. Um, so you can get it in a gold or silver trim. Uh, however, it's quite a jump up. You're talking about going from, you know, a $23 pen up to a $144 pen uh, or up from there because you can get it in, you know, different versions. You can get the metal version and stuff like that. Um, the nib itself is going to be softer. It generally, people like the softness and the way that this pen writes a little better than the Ahab. It doesn't require quite as much force, but it also doesn't write quite as broad as the, the Falcon does. The Falcon is made, or sorry, as, as the Ahab does. The Ahab is made to have those tines really spread out wide. That's why it has a slit that cuts all the way up the nib. Um, the Falcon is not that way. Um, technically, they call the Falcon a soft nib. It's not even called a flex nib from Pilot. Um, they don't have any language, flex language in any of their lineup. Um, so we see problems sometimes with the Falcon when people say like, oh, it's a step up. You think, oh, it should flex more or flex better than say an Ahab should, and then people can flex it too far and ruin the nib. I've seen that happen on more than one occasion. So you gotta kinda watch out for that. You gotta adjust your expectations and not push it too far. Um, when you go out to something like the Custom 912 with the Falcon nib, which is confusing because it's not a Pilot Falcon, it's called the Falcon or the FA nib on the Custom 912, um, it's a little softer 
then the Falcon or the Ahab for sure does not spread quite as wide as the Ahab if you really push the Ahab. Uh, and it's considerably higher in price. You're talking literally 10 times the price of an Ahab. So is it worth that much of an upgrade? You know, that's a judgment call, but you're paying for a lot of different stuff on the pen. It's quality of the pen, the size of the pen's a little bigger than the Falcon. Um, is it worth it? That's a personal call, but it's hard to say just on the price alone that it's going to be an upgrade that's going to be a better experience for you than the Ahab. I will say I have more consistency, more people that kind of like the regularity of the pens like the Falcon and the Custom 912, uh, but for the money, that Ahab is just really tough to beat. You know, I remember back when there really were no alternate options besides the Falcon, the Pilot Falcon called Namiki Falcon back then. In fact, this one actually is a Namiki Falcon. It says Namiki on it um, back before they changed it over to the Pilot Falcon. Um, but uh, I remember back when that was really the best option. I mean, you could go with something vintage and you still can, though of course vintage pens are becoming somewhat more rare every year because um, they're not making any more of them. Uh, so that's something that uh, is is always been kind of a challenge. And back, you know, six, seven years ago, I remember when I was kind of first getting into flex pens and stuff like that, uh, really it was pretty much you get a Falcon or you would get some refurbished vintage pen. And uh, the refurbished vintage pens were not any cheaper. In fact, they were often much more expensive than a Falcon. So you really couldn't even try any type of flex experience for less than say $140 or something like that. Now the Falcon might've been a little less back then. Um, but Noodlers came out and completely changed the game um, with the Nib Creeper first and the Ahab came next, then you had the Conrad and then the Neponset. Um, now it's just, we take it for granted because it's like Noodlers pens are available everywhere. Not everywhere, but they're, they're the retailers who carry them have somewhat of a regular stock of at least most of the colors. Um, and it's not this epic battle to try and get an affordable flex pen. And so now we're thinking like, oh, well, what's in between? There must be something in between. We're still just in a relatively new uh, phase of availability of these flex pens. You know, it's not like these things are commodities and they're just widely available and there's all these tons of options. So while there are people that talk about it and the Noodlers pens themselves are more widely available than they really ever have been. Uh, it's still just not like all these different uh, options in between. So pretty much that is the upgrade is going to the Falcon. Um, I think I would love to see some kind of in between stuff and I'm hearing rumblings about some things maybe they're gonna be developed next year from some different brands about stuff. You know, there've been some other things that have kind of tried to come in there but just haven't quite hit the mark in terms of reliability and sticking around. Flex pens are tough and doing it affordably is, is really tough and trying to hit in a specific price range in a sweet spot uh, can be a challenge for these flex nibs. So um, it does it does present a unique challenge for the manufacturers and I think the, the flex nib demand in general is kind of in flux. The market is still trying to kind of figure out what to do with these flex pens and where they kind of fall. But uh, in general, it'll be it'll be interesting to see kind of what develops there over the next couple of years. Um, I just I don't I don't know exactly, um, but I know that uh, Noodlers has created a really uh, a fantastic demand for flex pens that are available to people. Uh, and, and frankly, that was Nathan Tardis vision when he came out with these pens. You know, they're not the most premium level pens and he never wanted it to be that. He wanted to go for maximum affordability and utility so that flex pens could be something that the masses, whatever that means, could become aware of these pens with the hopes that other manufacturers would then see that there's demand for it and want to invest and do research and development and kind of come up with these products. And then hopefully the demand and the groundswell would increase uh, such that they could become kind of a more regular offering. So we're still in the process, zooming out to like a 50,000 foot view here. We're still in the process in terms of the overall fountain pen marketplace of seeing where the demand for flex pens go within the kind of hardcore fountain pen using community, it seems so obvious, like why aren't there more flex pens? But in terms of overall global demand, you know, in terms of viability of having affordable products, because when you have affordable products to get all macroeconomic on you, you have to have volume to be able to make the price affordable. And we just, in the grand scheme of things, are not at the volume of kind of that mid-range flex pen 
to where it's super obvious for a bunch of different manufacturers to dive into it. So um, there's most of the pens that are coming out are either super affordable like this or they're much more expensive. And you, there's not really anything in between yet. So there's kind of a gap. So anyway, that's kind of my perspective on it. That's how I see. Um, you know, one thing that might be kind of an option for you uh, in the interim is uh, going with something that has a titanium nib. Now, granted, with titanium nib, you're kind of in like more soft nib territory. It's not a true flex. You do get some line variation and stuff. It is easy to overdo it and spring the tines and you have to bend them back and stuff like that and that can get a little messy but something like the Keras Customs Titaniums which we introduced a little while ago. Um, there's other brands that have titanium nibs on them here and there. It's pretty much Bach that makes these titanium nibs so most of the manufacturers who are using Bach nibs may have titanium as an available option uh, but that could be something. So the Keras Customs Titanium, uh, it's only on the larger size, uh, the ink pen that you can use that titanium nib because they don't have one that fits the fountain K. Um, but that could be something to keep your eye on as well. All right, next question I have is from Nadia Zarin on Instagram. I'm having a typical problem among fountain pen users. Ink smear on my hands. I don't mind this as much as I do smudged notes on my Rhodia. I love using medium sized nibs on my Rhodia. Oh, how they glide like butter, almost frictionless. Unfortunately, they smudge whenever any moist your moisture from my fingers made contact with the written words. Is there any way for me to fix this or should I just, should I just cease using my Rhodia? Oh, that's so sad to hear because I too love the feel of Rhodia paper and that medium nib on Rhodia paper. I understand exactly where you're coming from and why you love the feel of your Rhodia paper and I hope that you can find a way to make it work and not have to give it up. Um, so a couple things that are going on here. One is that you're using a very smooth paper. It has a lot of clay content. It's very slick. So your dry time is going to be longer. Um, I don't know all the details and scenarios of exactly why it's smearing. I don't know if you're a lefty, maybe you're smearing over top of it or whether it's just you're holding the pad and you're smearing it or you're just kind of writing all over the place. I don't know, there could be a lot of different scenarios as to what's actually physically causing, but clearly some kind of contact with your hand is coming with the ink. Um, so one of the first things you can do if you don't want to change your nib and you don't want to change paper, well, there's only one thing left. There's a trifecta here going on. You have your pen, your paper, and your ink. So your ink is your last variable in the equation here. So it could be that you're using an ink that has a slightly longer dry time and that by perhaps changing the ink, you could therefore fix your problem. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go with a fast drying ink because some of those can bleed and feather pretty bad. So you may not want to go that route, but it could be depending on whatever ink you're using, I don't know, but it could be that you would want to switch to something that would just dry a little faster. If you look at our reviews on GoodlyPens.com, you can sometimes see um, you know, dry time is a, a rating that people can give in their reviews. So you can see there, I don't have any type of scientific study that says like how quick the dry time is on all the different inks, that would be great, but I don't have anything like that um, for everything. Um, we have certain reviews and stuff that we've left on our own reviews that we of what we've done. We'll put that on the product page. So sometimes it's an alternate image on there. Sometimes it's on the, uh, the reviews that other customers have left on our site. So you can kind of peruse through a particular color that you might like. You can see whatever color that you're using on your Rhodia, you can see how that's rated on there. And then you can see maybe perhaps if there's something that typically is known as being a little bit better. Um, but usually what's going on is if you have an ink that is less saturated in its color, the dry time will often be a little quicker. Because what happens is the dye content that's in the ink has a longer dry time or the lubricant that's used to help the heavier concentrated dye inks uh, flow through the pen properly um, will add to the dry time. So if you have anything with, with extra lubrication like the Noodler's Eel series, um, if you have anything that has permanent qualities to it, sometimes the permanent inks can take a little longer to dry, um, especially with the more um, ink resistant papers like Rhodia. Um, the way that the inks like the Noodler's inks, for example, um, and that covers a lot of the permanent inks because Noodlers makes a ton of them. 
um, they need to absorb down into the actual cellulosic fibers, their cellulose reactivants, the noodles ones specific, specifically. They're cellulose reactive, so they need to absorb down actually into the pulp fiber of the paper before they become permanent. So anything that is not absorbed in yet will smear. So if it's happening, you know, pretty quickly, sometimes literally it can take a day or two to fully like cure and dry and adhere to have those permanent qualities. Now it should doesn't mean it should smear after a day or two, um, but it, it means that it to be fully permanent may not process that quickly. So going away from kind of permanent qualities uh, can help. Going with something that's a little bit less saturated in color doesn't necessarily have to mean lighter in color, though it often can, but just something that looks more watery, if you will. Um, so more shading, uh, looks a little more watery, and doesn't have like a deep, deep saturation in there. Noodler's ink specifically are heavily saturated inks. Um, Nathan does that by design. Um, and often the brighter, punchier, more saturated colors will have a longer, excuse me, dry time, especially on these ink resistant papers. Um, so that covers it. Um, anything like heavy sheening, heavy shimmering inks um, will often smear a little bit more too. So you may want to just kind of be aware of that. Um, if you are trying that and it's still just not quite doing it, you can go with a finer nib. That is another thing. If you're, if you're ultimately your goal is to try to still use that paper, you can go with a, a slightly finer nib. Doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna sacrifice the smoothness of it. Um, though when you start to get into like fines and some of the extra fines, it's just gonna feel a little bit different than a medium. Part of the beauty of a medium is that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna feel smooth on, on much more than your fines and extra fines. The bigger the tip size you have on your nib, the smoother it's gonna feel. It's just like if you, you know, have roller skates that are tiny little roller skates wheels, you feel bumps a lot more than you do on a bicycle when the wheel's really huge, right? Like just the bigger it is, bigger the surface area, the smoother it's gonna feel. Um, so just kind of be aware of that. Um, another thing that you can try, and I don't know how much you'll be totally in love with this idea, is using a blotter. Um, so I have a rocker blotter right here. This is not necessarily practical if you're like out and about and journaling and stuff like that, but if you're at your desk, and you want to use a rocker blotter, Jay Urban makes them, and there's a couple other out there. The Jay Urban's the only one that I know that's like readily available. Um, and you use this blotter as you write. If you're like turning the page or whatever, you don't want to have anything that's coming over, you can take the blotter and you just go like this. And the paper is kind of absorbent, and it'll just pick up. You can see here I've got you know little bits of you know ink on mine. It's uh, it just picks up the little extra bits. Uh, and if you rock it back and forth, it's not gonna smear it. And it picks that up extra stuff and that can help a lot. Or sometimes what I'll do if I'm carrying around a notebook is I'll buy like the full sheets, full being a you know, relative term, the sheets that are made, the j sheets of the blotter paper. Or sometimes you can find blotter paper elsewhere, like printers and stuff have it. Um, I will uh, take that and take a full sheet and maybe cut it up and stick it in my notebook so that as I'm writing, I can either just kind of fold it over there or as I'm writing to keep transference from happening from one page to the other, I can just take that sheet of blotter paper, stick it in there, fold it up, and then be on my way and not have to worry about that um, you know, transfer over to the other side of the page. So those are a couple of things that you can look into as well, maybe before you even have to change your ink. Um, and that's kind of the last thing that I have. If you really are at the point where you just, you know that the roadie is not gonna work for you, you can go with a slightly more absorbent paper. I think looking into a Leuchtturm or an Apica uh, could help you. I think those would be ones that are somewhat comparable to Rhodia, but are slightly more absorbent, not gonna be quite as smooth. So you may wanna test it out a little bit, but um, those would be my recommendations. So hopefully that can help you out a little bit. All right, Limona de Blue on Instagram. Limonada Blue, there we go, that's what it is. Limon lemonade, Limonade, Limonade de Blue, wow, on Instagram. When cleaning pens where the nib and feed are friction fit, is it best practice to pull out the nib and feed or to leave it in? I'm pretty new to fountain pens and I've found it easier to clean my, to clean by fully disassembling the pen, but I've read some posts where it says that this can damage the fit of the nib and the feed if the pen it is done too much. Thanks for the help. You're very welcome. Um, so I grabbed a pen so that I can show you kind of what you're talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about because I do this all the time. So basically you have a pen. I have a Twisby Eco here. It is a pen. I use it. I love it. I want to switch out different inks. Great. I want to clean it out very thoroughly, right? So I'm going to pull my nib and my feed out. 
and then clean it all out, and then I'm gonna put it back, and then I'm gonna rock on and use my next tank. But three days later, I'm gonna pull it out, I'm gonna do it again. Three days later, I'm gonna do it out, put it again. Da -da 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 -da. On and on and on, right? So am I damaging my pen longer term by doing that? So the short answer is yes, with quotations. Um, you're technically causing more wear and tear on your pen when you fully disassemble it like that than you are if you don't. Now, when you fully disassemble it like that, you're also cleaning it more thoroughly than you are if you don't disassemble it. So is it better to more fully clean and disassemble it than it is to leave it in place and maybe not fully clean and disassemble it? So the short answer is it's completely up for debate. I have not yet, granted I have not been around for an infinite number of years, but I have not yet in my recent memory had anyone that's come back to me and let me know about damage that they've caused through wear and tear of disassembling their pens. I have had people come back and say, I disassembled my pen and I dropped my nib down the sink drain or I accidentally, you know, broke something or my cat got my feed or something like that. That I have heard about. So I don't know that it's necessarily so much of a wear and tear issue as it is like a risk exposure issue while you have your pen disassembled. Does that make sense? Um, so I think there's a greater risk of you dropping a piece or losing a component or something like that while you're disassembling your pen than it is purely just by the physical wear and tear that's caused by you cleaning and removing the pen constantly. Um, I think there's probably just as equal much risk, just as equal much, does that even make sense? I don't know, don't dissect my grammar please. There's probably just as much of an equal chance I just said it differently, that sounded a little more natural, um, of you causing damage by not cleaning the pen as well and having like dried up ink cake around your pen and then you go to take it apart and you like are really having to tug and pull and all that kind of stuff. It's probably just as much of a risk doing that. So I don't have any hard, fast data to tell you that one is better than the other. I think it's gonna be a matter of personal preference I think that most pen companies, when they tell you how to clean and maintain your pens, they're gonna not tell you to fully disassemble your pen because, and I know this from having been in the customer service business for the last eight years, not everybody knows how to put it back together properly, not everybody knows how to take it apart properly, and I think the warranty-related risk of telling everybody in the world who buys a certain pen that they should fully disassemble it every time they clean their pen um, would create more problems than it would solve. But you as an individual can use your own judgment to say, do I know how to take this pen apart? Am I gonna cause any damage to it by doing it? If you know how to take your pen apart well and you can do it without causing any damage to the pen, I say go nuts and just be aware that if you get into a warranty issue and you say, oh yeah, I was ripping the pen and feet apart and all that kind of stuff and you know the feed broke in half, the manufacturer might be like, well, we're not really crazy about you doing that, so we're gonna charge you a repair fee. Okay, fine. You may just have to kind of accept that if that's the case um, because you are kind of taking the pen apart somewhat further maybe than they may have determined that it should have been done. So you're kind of in a gray area there and that's just something that you do as a pen enthusiast to know that you're doing that. Just like if you, you know, are, if you buy a new car and they tell you you have to take it to the dealer and get it repaired and use only dealer authorized parts to maintain your full warranty. Well, you may be perfectly capable of replacing your alternator or charging up your air conditioning system. But if you do it and something goes wrong, even if it's not your fault, they might point to it and go, well, you didn't get it serviced by an authorized whatever by a, at an authorized place. Okay, you're right, technically. And you just kind of accept that. So you may be fully capable of taking it apart, do it at your own risk. And uh, I personally, just through my own experience, I will take a pen, my, my pens apart somewhat more often than I will not, with the exception of a couple of times. If I'm gonna clean it out and re-ink it with a very similar ink or an identical ink, I'll give it a quick cleaning just to get the kind of the parts smooth and flowing, but I don't need to do a thorough cleaning, so I'll not fully disassemble a pen. You know, a good example is like my uh, Visconti Homo Sapiens. I use that on a pretty regular basis. Um, and that pen is a pain to fully clean out. 
So I will just take, and it's a, it's a vacuum filler, um, and yeah, technically I can pull the nib. I haven't yet pulled the nib actually out of the housing on this pen, but I have unscrewed the housing out of it. Um, and I'll clean around there a little bit if I'm changing colors or something like that. Um, it can be a total pain to, to clean out very thoroughly, so I try not to change the color of the ink that drastically in this pen, just because it's not that fun to clean out. Um, a pen like the Eco Clear Demonstrator, it's also kind of a pain, so I'll try to stick to a similar color in its if I can. If it's a cartridge converter pen, yeah, I'll just go nuts on that thing, flush it out with a bulb syringe, pretty easy. If I can pull the nib and feed out on a fine, but a pen like a Lamy, a Safari, All-Star, something like that, yes, technically you can pull the nib and feed out of it, but honestly, it's kind of a pain. So unless I leave the ink sitting in there for a really long time and it's like crusted up and dried up and I have to really thoroughly clean it, I won't completely disassemble it. And you have to be careful there when it gets all crusty and dried up, then you get in a situation where it can dry up and actually adhere, so like somewhat adhere and give you some resistance on the nib and the feed, and that's when you can actually cause some damage through trying to sheer force of will, trying to rip the thing apart. Uh, I have definitely damaged some feeds. Um, I've damaged some Twisby feeds because their feeds, the fins on their feeds can be somewhat delicate sometimes. And if it's a real crusty situation and you go to rip that thing out of there, you can cause some problems. I've also, when I've taken pens apart before, sometimes you get this little post on the back of the um, feed. I've had it where I've gone to pull the pen apart and I've pulled up too much like this and I've snapped that little post right off the back of the feed. It doesn't render the pen useless, but it's not exactly great for the pen necessarily because otherwise what the heck is the point of having that thing there in the first place? Um, it's just not super ideal. So I've definitely damaged some stuff by taking it apart before. You have to kind of take that with your own knowledge and risk and acceptance of that. But um, I think that uh, the vast majority of the time, uh, <laughs> I'm dealing with people who are more not cleaning their pens enough and causing harm to their pens than they are uh, by cleaning them too much and too well. So I would say the, the vast majority of you who are listening to this, I think you probably would be well served by almost intentionally trying to clean your pens too well than you would by uh, not cleaning it well enough. Jen's outside my office. What do you need? She's gonna interrupt me right now. Decal people are here. Oh, the decal people. Sorry. She's gotta interrupt. I might even leave this in Q&A, just so you know. <laughs> Sorry. They need to audibly, yeah, that's right. I'll make them apologize. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I have to decide if I wanna cut that out. Anyway. All right, next question I have. This is from USA Fencer on Instagram. Can you eyedropper convert a pilot parallel? It's a great question. I would say whenever we carry any new pen here at Goulet Pens, the first question we always get is, is an eyedropper convertible? <laughs> and it's always amazing because we talk to our distributors and manufacturers and stuff like that. And apparently that's not as common of a question for other retailers. It's really kind of like a Goulet specific things. And I'm like, well, we got a lot of hardcore writers here. People like to use their pens. It's a legit question, I get it. So literally it's like whenever we have any meeting with a new distributor or somebody that's like, hey, we got this new pen, we got this new Monteverde Monza, whatever, we're like, is it eyedropper convertible? And they're like, I don't I don't know, I guess, maybe, I don't know, I'm not sure. And we're like, all right, get us a sample. We gotta test, <laughs> we gotta test it out. Uh, but anyway, this pen we've had for a while, the Pilot Parallel. So I have somewhat of a solid answer for you. Um, so uh, I think especially because now that the Pilot Con 40 is out, um, it doesn't have a huge ink capacity. Um, so the eyedropper convertibility of a pen like this, that's, you know, it's a stub nib uh, sort of, uh, that uh, italic stub sort of thing. Parallel nib is kind of its own breed, but it's definitely flat, kind of broader. It's more like a stub, I'll just call it a stub. Um, it's technically two plates that are together. Anyway, it's weird. Um, so it comes with cartridges. The actual, the Pilot cartridges are pretty decent. Good ink capacity. If you need to use them and refill with an ink syringe, it's a pretty solid way to go. Um, so you're, you're gonna be well served by doing that. And it comes with a couple of cartridges and you can get, you know, the Pilot Namiki cartridges are pretty good. Um, if you wanna use a converter, you can. It just doesn't have a huge ink capacity. So I understand the question of why you want eyedropper converted. So those of you who don't know, if you live under uh, a rock or if you, <laughs> sorry, that sounds really judgment, judgmental. If you're new to the fountain pen world and have not heard of eyedropper conversions, I'll give you a quick little assessment. It's where you fill the whole body of the pen with ink instead of using a cartridge or a converter or whatever. And then you have a nice large ink capacity. You don't have to worry about refilling it quite as often. It can be really nice for a pen like this because I think a lot of people who are using this are hand lettering people, artists, whatever. Not necessarily, it's a long kind of scripty pen. So you're probably having more long writing sessions and practicing doing, you know, uh, gothic calligraphy or something like that uh, with a pen like this than you are like bringing it to work and taking notes in a meeting. 
That's not quite what this pen is for, especially you get these fatter sizes. Like you can get it to a six millimeter wide. It's more like a brush pen at that point. I, I, I personally really consider the parallel to be more of sort of like a brush pen with a metal tip. Um, you can use it as a highlighter too. That can be really good if you're a college student or something like that. You do a lot of highlighting and stuff. You get highlighter ink like a Noodler's Firefly or something like that. And then you can just keep the pen inked up with highlighter ink. Um, that can be really good. That can be really good too. The 2.8 one is a really good size for that one. That's what this thing is. Um, so consider that. Anyway, uh, if you want to eyedropper convert this thing, uh, the short answer is can you do it? Yes, most of the time. And no, some of the time. Um, so the th tricky thing about this one, and I'll zoom in here so you can see what I'm talking about, um, is on the back of these pens, it has this indent right here. And you can zoom in. I'll zoom in really well so you can see it. Okay, so it has this indent that's pretty deep into the pen, right? And uh, that indent, for the most part, is pretty solid. Like it goes into there, but it doesn't uh, actually puncture through. So this particular pen and all the parallel, I have one of each color parallel, um, is fine. And I don't have a problem eyedropper converting any of these. But um, I have heard of people that that indent actually goes through uh, and punctures through a little bit and creates a tiny little hole. For those individuals, what you need to do is get a little bit, just a little bit of two-part epoxy and fill that hole in, and then you're fine. You know, it does change, slightly changes the aesthetic, but honestly, you don't really notice it because two-part epoxy, when it dries, it's clear. Um, so that fills it right in. Um, it's an extra step you have to do, of course. Um, but that's why Pilot doesn't advertise it as being eyedropper convertible. Um, honestly, the other kind of, you know, long uh, uh, calligraphy styled pen uh, that they have is called the Plumix. Um, that one is a much higher chance of having a hole in the back. So that one, I'm like, you really got to want it to make that happen. You pretty much have to consider you're going to have to epoxy it. Um, it's not like something like the Kakuno where it's like it has holes designed in the back of it. Um, that, you know, there's pens like that that the reason they design holes to be in the back of it on a pen like the Kakuno, they market it as a kid's pen. And so anything that's a kid's pen, they have to put holes in there because it's a choking hazard. So they put holes in the back of the pens. They don't do that for pens that they market towards adults necessarily. So that's why that where that comes from on some pens. That's not the situation with the parallel. They just have that indent and sometimes the indent is not perfect and it uh, will actually have a little puncture there. So a little bit of epoxy and you're in good shape. But the vast majority of the pens that I've seen anyway have actually been fine right out of the box. So I think just kind of go into it. If you know that you want to buy a parallel and you want to eyedropper convert it, be prepared emotionally that you're going to have to maybe, epo maybe epoxy it. Okay. Um, but you might also not have to. Um, so to eyedropper convert this thing, it's relatively simple. The easiest way to test if it's gonna hold water is you just blow on the back of it. Just, if you blow on the back of it and nothing happens, uh, and, it, and it makes your mouth feel pressure in there, um, it's because the air's got nowhere to go and it's gonna be fine. Uh, if you blow into it and you can hear like a, like a little bit of whistling and it's, it's kind of feels like you're blowing through a little bit of a straw, then you need to epoxy it in the back of it. Um, but if you don't, if you go, do that and you're fine, great, easy test, right? I can do the same thing with the Monza, for example. You know, I need to look through a bunch of these and make sure, but you just blow on the back of it, feels rock solid, and you're probably gonna be okay. Um, but the parallel, you do the, do the little blow test, you're gonna be fine. Um, so really, you only have one thing to worry about, which is um, silicone greasing the seal on this pen. So you don't have to worry about the cartridge converter or anything like that. Grab an ink syringe or an eyedropper or whatever really transfers the ink. You fill it up here. I don't know the full ink capacity of the body of this thing, but it's probably close to around five or six milliliters. It's pretty big, eh, maybe not six. That's a lot. Four, eh, four, it's pretty skinny. I don't know. It's gonna be a lot, three or four. Three to four, 3.77, we'll say. I have no idea, but it's gonna be a de decent amount of ink, way more than you get in a, just a cartridge or a converter. Um, so you do that, make sure that you don't fill it up and then set it down on its side like that because ink could pour out of it. Um, but just grab a little bit of silicone grease here. We sell silicone grease here or I've uh, seen like a clear plumber's grease. Um, Vaseline works in a pinch, but that's petroleum based and that can discolor your, your uh, plastic over time. So we use uh, food grade clear silicone grease here. A Little bit on your finger, a little bit on the threads of the grip of the pen. Um, you don't want to gob it on there so that it's like squishing out of the pen when you put it back together, but you want to make sure that it's kind of filling in the grooves of the 
of the thing nicely here. And the thing about the parallel that you got to watch out for, I'll try and zoom in so you can see this, is hard because it's clear. But there's a little notch right here that um, is a gap in the threads. Um, so you may, may need to throw on, I, I didn't even look at this part ahead of time, but you may need to throw on a little O-ring. You could probably silicone grease enough of it there to where it wouldn't uh, leak out of the pen. Um, and the threads actually fit on fairly tightly. Um, so you may be fine just greasing it up, but if you want to throw an O-ring on here, um, we sell platinum preppy O-rings, which I think would fit on here nicely. Um, but right here, if you put an O-ring on, that would give you some security, but it may be enough just to kind of fit up tightly against there, and you probably would be okay. Since you're not going to be carrying this thing around and jarring it everywhere, probably, I think you'd be all right. So if you want to skip the whole O-ring part, you probably can. O-ring would just be a little bit of extra assurance for you. But the silicone grease is, is kind of necessary, um, so I would definitely be prepared for that. Whew, there we go. Cool. So the short answer is, yeah, you can do it, but just be a little bit educated about how to do it. All right? Next question we have is an ink question from Iberby on Instagram. Can you travel with multiple converters with different inks in them for switching colors? Do people even do that? Or do you need to wash the pen between color changes? And can you store a half-used cartridge? Lots of questions. Um, okay, so first off, if you have multiple converters, the converter is really made for bottled ink. It's really not made for transport and storage. And the main problem is it's got an open end on it. So it really needs to be filled and then fit onto a pen or you fill it on the pen itself. It's not really a transport device. That's what cartridges are for. <laughs> so you have cartridges for their portability and you have converters for more regular use and refilling and using different bottled ink and stuff like that. The cartridges are for the convenience and the portability of them. Now you can't always get all inks in cartridge form. Um, so that can be the challenge, and I understand your desire to want to carry it around, but that's really not what converters are for. Now, technically, you ask, can you use a half -use, store a half-used cartridge or whatever? Um, the most successful thing that I've heard people use for sealing up cartridges, whether it's they want to fill their own cartridges, say you want to have a Noodler's ink in a cartridge. Noodler's is pretty anti-cartridge, so they do not want to use... Um, um, you know, the typical disposable standard international or whatever cartridges. So they don't, they don't offer their inks and cartridges, only bottles. Um, but if you say you wanted to carry a Ottoman Azure or Noodler's Black or whatever in cartridge form, you would have to fill it yourself. And then I've heard of people using um, a hot glue gun. So hot glue on the end of it. It's not completely fail safe, but that's kind of the best thing that I've ever heard people use. You kind of need to like scrape it off. It's, it may not work super great um, in all forms, but that's the thing that I've heard that's kind of worked the best. Um, you know, typically when they make these things, they make them and seal them up, um, and they are actually something that you puncture, like it's a part of the plastic that you puncture, it's not a sealing thing that they do, and then they usually plug it up on the other end when they actually manufacture these things. Um, so you're actually puncturing part of the plastic, and then um, that's how these things work. So it's not really like, it has a little cap that goes on and off, that'd be kind of cool I guess, but um, not a super universal thing, so you could check that out. Um, and then what was the other question that you had on there? Um, oh, do you need to wash out the pen in between color changes? Yes. Yes, you do. Um, I mean, if you don't, you end up running your colors together and depending on the inks that you're mixing, some inks mix fine, some inks don't, and they may clog up your pen or cause problems. Um, so that's just something you want to be aware of. It's, it's a good general practice to always clean out your pen in between color changes. So um, that's just kind of a general maintenance issue. Whether you're using cartridges or not, you want to clean out your pen in between. Um, but uh, I think that uh, pretty much for what you're doing, you're going to want to stick to just using the regular cartridges or just bring a bottle, you know, transport in some fashion, um, and then you can do it that way. Uh, the one exception, kind of ironically, uh, the one company that has kind of look to address kind of this specific issue um, is Noodlers, of all people. Um, for their Ahab pen, they have designed something called the 308 cartridge. Um, and it is a cartridge that has a screw cap that you can actually replace. So it's meant to be a portable cartridge that you can insert in place of the uh, piston mechanism on the Ahab. That's very specific just to the Ahab but it's decent ink capacity. You can seal it up, and for the people that I know that use them, they're a big fan of them. Um, 
it's certainly something to look into. You know, it's very specific to one pen model, but um, it's something that you could try, or at least be aware of if you weren't already. Um, and the other thing that I would kind of throw out there is this is a great opportunity to talk about the Visconti Traveling Inkwell. That's what I personally use when I'm traveling somewhere. Um, what I carry with me, you know, I have a pen case with way too many pens, um, and I will carry around with me my traveling inkwell because I can just fit it. I have a multi pen case, and I can just fit my traveling inkwell in with. Gotta make sure I don't have any pens that I can't talk about in here. Okay, we're good. <laughs> I use my traveling inkwell and I just carry around inside one of my pen slots. So it's very easy. It seals up well. It fills nicely. So that is great. It has about six mil capacity. So it's never, I've never needed to use more than this on any business trip that I've ever been on. Um, but I also carry around a bottle of. Uh, Robert Oster ink and I've used a uh, diamine 30 mil ink and stuff like that um, anything with a plastic bottle works pretty well on um, the Robert Oster I haven't flown with this because it's a 50 mil capacity I think it's larger than what you're allowed to carry around um, just loose um, in in that form that's where the diamine 30 mil bottles are really nice because they're plastic and they are fit within the one ounce rule on planes um, at least in the US anyway I don't know about most other areas what the rules are um, but that's the situation uh, with that. So this I'll carry around with me is a bottle of blue water ice, which I've been using uh, as of late. Um, and then I've got diamine marine in my traveling inkwell. So a couple little varieties. I need to pick more different colors because blue water ice and diamine marine, they're, they're both like turquoise teal colors. One slightly more, more blue, one slightly more green. But anyway, that's my burden. Cool. I think that's it. Yeah. All right. There you go. All right. Next question I have is from Jolly Green Giant on Instagram. Why do some inks have a really distinct inky smell? I have a Noodler's Turquoise that has a really distinct smell to it that none of my other inks have, and I'm curious as to why that is and why some inks smell different than others. Okay, it's a good question. Um, I will say I'm not an ink scientist, so I don't know specifically what components smell like what, um, but I believe you know there's a couple of key components that are causing the smells. One is the dyes themselves, and the other one is the biocides that are often used to kill off any molds or yeast or anything like that, any natural elements that can want to grow inside of your inks. So I think that's mo it's mostly the biocides, maybe some of the dyes. The dyes definitely have a component of smell to them. Um, some of the most interesting smelling inks can be some of the like specialty noodler's inks, because you, from what I understand, you're getting into components that are not used in many inks, uh, and they can have all kinds of interesting smells. Like Noodle's Kung Tu Cheng has a very interesting smell to it. Wyoming Sepia has an interesting smell, and they've just got different components to it. Um, Noodle's is kind of known for having some, some of the most pungent smells. <laughs> That's because they have very highly concentrated dyes, um, and Nathan makes sure that uh, nothing is gonna grow in his ink. He's very passionate about not having mold grow in his inks. Um, and I very rarely hear about an issue with any of that. So um, that's typically what you're dealing with. I really wouldn't sweat it too much because again, those are both components that are really pretty helpful to have in your inks. Um, and the, the scent of the ink itself matters way less than how it actually performs on the page. Um, there are some inks out there that are actual scented inks. Diatramentis has the widest variety of scented inks. Um, they are not something that lasts a very long time, honestly. It's more for the writer, the person that's writing. Um, so if you are smelling something pungent, it's it's really only something that you're gonna smell while you're filling the ink, um, unless you have a particular sensitivity to the smell and it really bothers you. Um, but for most folks, um, it's really just when you first kind of open it, you kind of intentionally smell that ink. Other than that, most of the time, I don't even notice the smells of my inks anymore. Maybe I've burned off my nose hairs or something from all the stuff I've smelled. Um, but uh, it's really not something that I find to be too bothersome or it really is a factor for me at all in any ink that I use. Um, I think most people pretty much feel that way. It's just something you kind of notice. You're like, oh wow, that smells very strong. Do I need to be worried about that? No, It's the smell is an after effect. It's the ink and the components that are in the ink are doing their job. There might be a smell just because there's a smell. Um, but uh, you might smell it a little bit when you're filling it. When you're writing with it, you're pretty much never gonna smell it. And certainly once ink dries on the page, whoever receives that or looks at it later, you're not gonna smell anything. So it's really not anything that you need to be overly concerned about, okay? All right, I'm gonna close it out with a rather robust business question. So I'm going to take a nice sip of water before I get into this one, if you don't mind. Oh, we're chugging along on this video today. Ah, 
All right. This question is from Chicole XD on Instagram. Forgive me, I botched your name. Why should you consider, or sorry, let me start that over. When should you consider to pay yourself when starting a business? Okay, so this has nothing to do with Penn specifically, right? But, uh, and I'm not overly qualified to talk about this very much. All I can really do is talk about my own experience because I've started a business where I did not pay myself and I had to make this decision for myself. At some point I had to decide when do I pay myself. So um, I have something to lend in this way, take it for what it's worth and make your own decisions. This is not legal or financial advice. Please don't sue me. All right, um, so for me, it's kind of a simple answer, but it's also a complex answer. I'm gonna very good, be very much into a paradox on this one. Um, so my answer is you pay yourself no sooner than you can afford it and also no later than you can afford it. And what I mean by that is uh, when you start a business, the biggest thing that is a mental shift for most people, and I'm talking about a small business, like it's just you, you're doing it, you're not a, you're not a venture cap, you know, experienced entrepreneur kind of thing. You're really just trying to get it off the ground, right? Because that's most, most businesses and that's, that was the situation I was in. I was just a dude trying to do a thing that I enjoyed and trying to make a living at it, right? That's most people, most businesses when they start off with that way. And that's kind of the nature of your question I'm pulling out. So um, when you start out, you're like, I'm just a dude, whatever, I wanna sell some stuff, I wanna make some money, let's go. Um, but the thing that you have to think about that's a little bit different is when you start a business, it really is another entity. Even if you don't legally have a separate entity, if it's just you, you're a sole proprietor, and you just wanna make money under your own name or do a DBA, a doing business as, set up a different name. I'm you know, Brian's Pens or the Goulet Pen Company when it first started out. Um, it was still just me. Everything was tied to my own identity and the money all flowed through me and stuff like that. You still have to think of it as a separate entity, okay? The biggest problem, biggest thing that trips up most small business owners is they don't think of the business as a separate entity from themselves. And they end up commingling their funds and they don't have proper distinction between the taxes and the business and the expenses and, and income and all that and they mush it all together and it becomes really muddy and really unclear. And that just puts you at an audit risk for the IRS because they really like it when people aren't clear about where their money is coming from because they can go in and they can clean it all up and charge you all these fees. I'm not gonna say they like it, okay, that probably sounds wrong, but that is a flag for them because that is a way that a lot of people, um, you know, get around taxes. Uh, if you are gonna be starting a business, you have to set up a separate checking account for your business and make sure that you do not mix it with your personal checking account. So. The biggest thing is keep your business money separate from your personal money. And then get really muddy in the beginning because when you're just you and you just start selling something, it's not much money, whatever, you just start selling a couple of things and it's like, why do I wanna go set up a separate checking account, go through all these things and you gotta pay fees for all these various things. You have to pay something at the courthouse to do a DBA and all this kind of stuff. Well, you're starting a business. You know, If you're taking income selling stuff, if it's over a certain dollar amount, which is really a pretty low dollar threshold, if you're, if you're selling like something on eBay or Etsy once or twice, that's fine. But if you start to really do it, um, like actually do it, uh, you need to set up a separate account. And then you need to track all that stuff separately from you. And then you need to literally pay yourself a salary out of the business to yourself personally. And it can mess with your head a little bit when you first start out because you're like, wait a minute, I am the same person. I have two different checking accounts and I have to pay myself out of one checking account into another checking account. What does it matter? It's all the same. No, it's not all the same. It's very different. You have to think of it differently. Otherwise, you're gonna screw yourself up and you're gonna get all mixed up and you're gonna make mistakes. And then you're either gonna mismanage your funds or you're gonna get audited and get into trouble, okay? So you gotta separate that stuff out. That's like the biggest, broadest, you know, shotgun blast of advice that I can give for anybody just starting out in a business is keep that crap separate. And you can literally, you can go, you know, don't have any shame or embarrassment here. Go to like Barnes and Noble or Amazon or whatever and buy like one of these for dummies books, like how to start a business or how to start an LLC or something like that. And it'll break all this stuff down for you. Just do, just do that. Like, it's no shame. It's, it's hard to start a business. There's a million different details. If you've never done it before, whatever, you're ignorant. You're not dumb, you're ignorant. 
hopefully, maybe you are dumb, I'm just kidding, but you're just ignorant, you just don't know. So you buy a book, whatever, and you figure out all this stuff. Um, so that's one thing I can definitely encourage you to do. Um, separate all that stuff out, and then really what you need to do is understand the basics of kind of financial accounting for your business. If you are bringing in, let's say it's $1,000 a month, that's pretty decent, right? Like you're kind of rocking and rolling with your business, $1,000 a month, you're gonna have all kinds of expenses and all kinds of things going on in your business. You cannot look at it as, oh, I have $1,000, therefore I can pay myself $1,000. No, no, it doesn't work that, <laughs> doesn't work that way. You got expenses, you gotta like, you know, pay for all the expenses. And remember, you're keeping all your business stuff separate from your personal stuff. So yeah, initially you might be like, oh, okay, whatever. And I went through this as a pen maker. I was like, oh, okay, I wanna start making pens. Well, I'm just kinda of goofing around, it's a hobby. Let me buy a lathe, let me buy some wood, and I'll just kinda of whatever, I'll buy it with my money, and I'll kinda of start messing around with it. But then I start selling some pens, and I'm like, okay, I have some money. What do I do with this now? And well, what about the lathe? I paid for the lathe, so what does that mean? And I wanna be able to, one of the advantages you have in running a small business is you get to deduct your expenses off of your taxes. It doesn't just all count as income, right? So there's an advantage to doing that. So you have to account for all that stuff separately. And then when you start selling, you start traveling, you start you know, being able to write off your gas, doing all this kind of stuff. So you get account for all that stuff separately in its own thing. And really, you, as the person who's starting the business, you, as an owner, at least, you know, I don't know if this is universal, but at least in Virginia here with an LLC, um, you can withhold paying yourself a salary until you um, kind of reach a certain point, right? Like, because you have expenses, you, you know, you, you're not legally required to draw a salary right off the bat because you don't really have anything viable yet in the beginning. Um, so Rachel and I, when we first started out, I was making pens, I was making pens out of wood, I was buying wood, I was buying pen kits, I was uh, I had expenses of doing craft shows and stuff like that, and we had a website, and we had all these expenses, and I was drawing an income, but it was all going right back out. Like at the end of the day, I wasn't profiting, and I wasn't, I wasn't withdrawing a salary. At the end of the day, I wasn't profiting anything, even without paying myself a salary. So I did the pen making thing for two and a half years, from like mid 2007 when I just started goofing around until late 2009 when we got into the fountain pen thing, uh, I never drew a penny of salary for myself because I didn't have a viable business. So that's what I mean in the first part of my statement when I say you don't pay yourself when you're starting a business any sooner than you can afford it. The business couldn't afford it because I, as the business owner, the founder, hadn't done my job. Yes, I'd done a lot of work, but I hadn't done my job of building a viable business yet. Now, there's different ideologies here that say you should pay yourself first and all this kind of stuff. I say that you in the founding of your business should withhold as long as you personally can afford to uh, and allow to reinvest into your business and grow it and try and make it viable. And that might take a while. It's not unusual for a business to take three to five years to become profitable. I'm not saying you should wait three to five years to withdraw any kind of a salary out of it, but until you have a really profitable up and running business, it might take three to five years, and you kind of need to be ready for that. So the, the thing that I think trips most people up when starting a very small business is you start it, it takes a while to get things off the ground, it takes a while to just kind of understand all the expenses and the structure and stuff like that and get a good flow of what, what product or what service you have that even works, and then to consider what should you pay yourself as a fair wage, that kind of seems like gravy after a while. It's like, well, really, honestly, when Rachel and I started our business, the whole dream that we had was to get it viable enough to where we could withdraw our regular paycheck. You know, forget all this fanciness that we have now. We just wanted to actually get paid for the work that we did. And it took us from the, from the start of when we did the pen making thing in mid 2007, that's when I first bought the lathe. It was kind of a hobby for a little bit at first, but I'm, I'm just gonna call it that. Mid, you know, it was like July of 20, 2007. We did not actually start paying ourselves from Goulet Pen Company until I think it was October of 2010. Okay, so it was a little over three years um, that it took for us to find kind of a viable business model and then actually start drawing money out of it. We had invested plenty of money into it, uh, but we did not draw money out of it until then. So we started selling fountain pens in November of 2009. So that's when I consider like my pen making 
career to kind of end and uh, the retailing and fountain pen side of things really picked up and that was like the rebirth of the Goulet Pen Company and that's what we consider the Goulet Pen Company's actual anniversary is November 17th, 2009. Um, and uh, it was from that point on, it was almost a year uh, to the point where we had actually a viable, somewhat profitable business. Um, it took us almost a year before we actually withdrew anything for ourselves. So you need to be ready for that. Um, I, I think you get romantic about starting a business and you know maybe you have an opportunity, you have a really big client, you have a really big whatever order or whatever it is for whatever it is that you're doing and you think, oh yeah, I'm gonna take this leap. But man, I tell you, there's so many expenses that happen and just so much that you aren't aware of in the beginning. You need to be prepared personally, financially, to be able to take that time. Uh, to really be able to do it. Now I was really kind of messing around in the early stages, so I was, you know, I had I had devoted a good amount of pretty much full time effort into it for that two and a half years before we got into the fountain pen thing. Um, but even still, I was working on our house a lot, and I was I don't know if I was working a full 40 hours every week. I probably was working close to that because I was just working around the clock all the time. But um, you know, uh, we didn't really find our groove until until that 2009 when we started the fountain pen thing. Um, but yeah, so I would say you need to wait as long as you possibly can to make sure that your business is solid and viable. And that's if you're like kind of bootstrapping it, right? So that's my story and I can, I can lend you my perspective on that. The other side of it too is, you know, if people, if you're later in life and you've got a good amount of money saved up um, or if you, you know, want to go out and take out a loan or raise some venture capital or something like that, get investors in, um, you know, it could be a different scenario for you. You know, for example, if you're pretty well connected and you've got some investors, you've got a business idea that requires a lot of capital, you're raising, you know, 300, 400,000, a million dollars, whatever, and you need to start a viable business, you need to hire a team of people, you're going to have to start paying out salaries. You can make a choice to pay yourself a salary. I would still recommend you pay yourself as low as is fair and legal to do, which if you're the founder, you can still pay yourself pretty much nothing um, in most scenarios. You can hire a team and you can opt to not pay yourself anything until you reach a certain level of profit and stuff like that. You want to make sure you consult your, your CPA or whatever to make sure that whatever you're doing is fair and legal. Um, but uh, you can withhold from, from paying yourself for a bit while you're just getting things off the ground. Um, you get to a point where, you know, with most business structures, if you withhold yourself from any salary and you're taking a lot of big profit distributions, that's where you can get into some trouble, I think, because then you're not paying FICA and Social Security tax and stuff like that at the same rate, and that's where you can become an audit risk as well. So you got to make sure that you're consulting a professional about how you're doing things, um, but just be aware that you have some options there. You don't have to, <laughs> it seems crazy to me that like, you, you know, some folks would consider going out and getting an SBA loan for $500,000 not even have a profitable, viable business model and start withdrawing a $100,000 salary on day one, that is not a real solid footing for a business plan. Um, and I think that trips a lot of people up. I think you need to be prepared to really ride it out and sacrifice and make it, uh, make it work for your business first before you are looking to really withdraw a salary. And if you're in a situation where you really need to withdraw that salary from day one, be careful because you may be putting yourself on, on sandy foundation uh, in the start of the business because if things don't work out perfectly for you, then the business may not be viable and may not be good. So um, just kind of want to throw that out there. Just be, be attentive, be very intelligent about what is it you're doing there. Um, let's see here. Oh yeah, what else is going on? I was going to tell you a little bit more of my story. Um, yeah, so for us, you know, going back just a little bit here, what happens when I go off my notes. I'm like, oh yeah, I thought I would mention that. Um, so Rachel and I, when we, we, I did the pen thing two and a half years, then we got in the fountain pen thing and um, we weren't paying ourselves anything. Rachel was working uh, for another company at the time as we started that. And then we had our son. She, did, she decided not to go back to work because personally we wanted to be at home with our kid. Um, but we still weren't paying ourselves a salary yet. In fact, at that time, we still needed more money to ramp up inventory and we didn't have the personal savings to do it. So I actually borrowed a little bit of money from my parents um, that summer in 2010 when we were just trying to ramp up. I remember I bought, we bought uh, Private Reserve, Diamine, um, and uh, I think those were the two big brands. And then we ended up getting into Noodlers uh, kind of on the tail end of that. But um, we needed to buy inventory and we didn't have the cash. so. Um, we, we did that. We opted, uh, you know, just to borrow money. That was the only money that we've ever, uh, ever borrowed uh, from this business. 
um, was that small loan from my parents for a couple of months. Um, so we were not, not only were we, had we sunk everything into it, we were not withdrawing any salary. I took out a small loan from my parents um, and I paid that loan back before we withdrew any salary for ourselves. That's how committed we were to it. And we pretty well depleted our personal savings. We were, we were close. We were real close because it was, you know, we, we had a new baby. We were 25 years old um, and we did not, we had some savings, but it wasn't a, a gobs of it. And we we're in an inventory based business. We needed inventory. So working for free for ourselves made a big deal. It was a big difference that we had. Um, and that was make or break. Um, and that little boost my parents gave us there is really what we needed um, at that time. And it was, it was attentive and, you know, it was uh, it was not done without a lot of conversation around it, um, but it ended up working out well for us. And then we withdrew a modest salary, and then as we grew, we were able to increase it to um, you know being fair. But man, I remember so many uh, dinners where it was peanut butter and jelly, or macaroni and cheese, or you know like boxed dinners that you just like unpack and stick in the oven. Oh, we did not eat great at that time, but it was cheap, and that's what we needed to do. Uh, and now we have health issues, so go, <laughs> go figure. Maybe we kind of put our foot in our mouths there. But anyway, um, so you got to do what you got to do, and that's kind of where we're at. So um, the one thing that I would encourage you, you know, definitely check out some of the um, – some of the, like for dummies books if you're literally just trying to figure it out. Another book if you're like a little bit further along and you're trying to figure out like, okay, I've got I've got a, a, a solid business model here. How do I know when to hire? How do I know when to kind of get things going here? Um, there's a book that I found within the last year that has helped me. It's actually I'm, I'm a little further along even than this book's sweet spot is. But if you're if you're in the point where you are starting to hire the first couple of people, or you're looking to get to the point where you need managers or something like that, if you have like between you know just yourself, if you need to hire kind of that first person, or like maybe uh, 10, 15 people, um, there's a book called. Uh, Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits by Greg, Greg Crabtree. I don't love the title of the book, but it's got some pretty solid, pretty understandable um, you know, stuff in there about how much money you should draw out, and it breaks down some of the biggest kind of uh, managerial, managerial accounting principles um, that are helpful in a small business uh, that I would recommend that you check out. It could be really helpful for you. So anyway, that's kind of where I'm at. I think that's everything I wanted to cover. Yeah, I had one thing that I missed in my notes, but whatever, it's good enough. All right, so that's my advice for you today. If you want to start a small business, it's hard, get ready, but it's a lot of fun. All right, question of the week that I have for this week um, is kind of just piggy tailing off of that. Piggy tailing? Piggy backing. I can't believe I just said that. I said that in a company meeting like two years ago. I said piggy tailing once by slipping up. And now my team constantly says piggy tail. And I just did it again in Q&A. So anyway, piggy tailing, that's a thing now. To piggy tail off the, <laughs> off the business question here. My question for you, and this is kind of like a little bit of a job interview type question, but I'm curious to get your, your gears turning. If you could start any business venture and be guaranteed success, at least for the first year, just kind of get off the ground, uh, what would you start? I find that most people have some kind of a cool idea, but they just get hung up in the, you know, fear of it all. Because the business failure rate is remarkably high. Understandably so, business is tough. But uh, I'm curious to hear what your ideas are. If you feel you've got some grand idea that you want to keep to yourself, then of course, you should save that for yourself. But generally speaking, I think it's just neat to hear what your ideas are. So um, that's what I've got for you today. I hope you have enjoyed this Q&A. I hope you have a great weekend, great rest of the week. Be sure to subscribe to all our channels if you haven't already. You can check out most of the products I talked about here on GoulayPens.com. Hope you have a great weekend and right on.